Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be an active participant once again in this worship experience. We thank you for our tithes and offerings. Allow them, Lord, to continue to expand the work that you've called us to do while it is day. For we know night cometh when no man or woman can work it. We ask that these funds be extended and expanded to those that are lost, left, and alone. In Christ Jesus' name we pray and give all thanks to thee. Amen. Uh oh. Time for me. <laughs> Again, giving honor to God for this opportunity to be before you. Uh, I want to thank my wife for making her way here. I hope she didn't go down Sprague Road either and <laughs> start to slide. But she's here, and I thank her for that opportunity to come and share with her presence. Uh, yes, I was also at the leadership conference. It was a wonderful time. I just, as my brother was sharing, and I kept looking at him, and I realized, yes, he was. He was up there leading the worship. And you should be proud of him. He represented fields in high standard. And <laughs> high standard. He even got a little happy. Well, we thought, oh, we about to go Baptist here. He, was, he, he had them moving. He had us moving and um, uh, very energetic, very unreserving in praising the Lord. So he knows how good he has been to him. And you all should reflect on how good the Lord has been to you. Luke, 10th chapter, the 30th and the 31st verse. And it is written, and I'm sharing from the New Life version. It's a translation that I use in in prisons, in jails, um, uh, it's easier to absorb and digest. Um, not saying it is remedial, but it's 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 a more comforting. And for we know the King James is very poetic, uh, very soothing for us. But those that are incarcerated, a lot of times need something a little more current per se. And it is written that Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to the city of Jericho. Robbers came out after him. They took his clothes off and beat him. Then they went away, leaving him almost dead. A religious leader was walking down that road and saw the man, but he went by on the other side. Say that again. A religious leader, a religious leader, a religious leader was walking down that same road and saw the man saw the man, but he went by on the other side. In the same way, a man from the family of Levi was walking down that road from Levi. And he saw the man, was hurt, and he came near him, but kept on going on the other side. It's kind of like you're driving on an accident and you look and you're just looking as you drive by. Then a man from the country of Samaria came by. He went up to the man as he saw him. He had loving pity on him. He got down and put oil and wine on the places where he was hurt and put cloth around them. Then the man from Samaria put his man on his own beast, this man. He took him to a place where people stayed for the night and cared for him. The next day, the man from Samaria was ready to leave. He gave the owner of that place two pieces of money to take care of the man. And he said to him, take care of this man. For more than this, I will give it to you when you come again. I will give it to you when I come. Ministry of Loving Kindness. The book of Matthew, a great part of this discourse, this discourse excuse me, is devoted to the subject of Jesus coming again. When his death on the horizon and knowing his disciples would be stunned to the brink of their faith, Jesus takes a great deal of pains to explain that they 
would yet realize their hope in a far grander way than they had yet ever dreamed nor conceived. The 25th chapter is painted, painting the final judgment scene, a passage in the Bible illustrating how common kindness affect our standing in eternal world, in the eternal world, excuse me. The book of Luke, the Good Samaritan, is a classic on the subject of human kindness. Luke had just shared how Jesus was rejected by the Samaritans. You'll find that in chapter 9 of Luke in the 52nd chapter. Here Jesus' reaction is to exalt a Samaritan to a love of all the ages to come. He was rejected by the Samaritans, but yet he exalts a Samaritan. Christ talks about plain old kindness, everyday kindness, common kindness. He puts so much stress on kindness that he identifies himself with those who need it. And in effect, he tells us that we cannot, we cannot be friends with him at the same time, be indifferent to the suffering of others. He talks of heaven being inhabited by only those who have learned how to be kind, always kind, and in all ways kind. You know, Christ came to build a world of beings that, like himself, and when completed, no others will be there. You'll find that in Matthew 25, verses 40 through 45. But he further shares that there are going to be some surprises in the day of judgment. The religious folk, not spiritual, the religious folk who have accustomed themselves to think of themselves as being in we'll find out too late that they had been overlooking the things the angels had been recording. Everything we do, everything we do is recorded by the angels. For not one act of kindness, no matter how will in God's economy of universal government go unrewarded. A good Samaritan is a person who graciously gives help or sympathy to someone in distress. Good Samaritan. Well, what does that have to do today? What does that have to do in this age? What does that have to do in this recommitment Sunday? Well, not here. Because I've heard nothing but wonderful, wonderful things, and have experienced wonderful things from Fields United Methodist Church. Because before I knew you and you knew me, you helped me in so many ways as was shared earlier, the things that you do, but also in your apportionment givings through the conference, that has helped us. Where's a fund that we have called the cookie jar. And in that cookie jar, we have helped people keep lights on, our clients' families. We've helped provide scholarships for kids to go to Christian camps. You've even helped me in my aftercare with our young men that were in college. Because it doesn't end when they graduate. They needed someone to continue to follow up behind them. So I was getting on the road with my little hoopty, my little rusty bangy car. But you helped me. You continued to allow me to go and allow those professors to know that these young men have someone that you can call on to help you help them get it right. So I take this moment to thank you for your support. I thank you for your prayer, your prayer, prayer, excuse me. I thank you also for letting your pastor spend time with me. I was blessed to treat him to a golf outing last year. And I thank you for allowing him to steal away just for a minute for us preachers to get together and fellowship out in nature and God's divine handiwork. We hit the ball. We missed the ball. We prayed. We even cried. It was a wonderful time. And I thank you for that, that you allowed him a moment to steal away with this black preacher. Thank you so much. A good Samaritan, ministry of loving kindness, the first thing we have to see is that this man was leveled, fell upon robbers. And you don't have to be in the wrong place to be robbed. And I'm not just talking about your stuff. I'm not talking about your jewelry. I'm not talking about your Rolex watch. I'm not talking about your wallet, your credit card. I'm talking about you can be robbed of your dignity. Life has a way of doing that. Men, we are the head of our homes. Wives, you are the heart of our homes. And children, you're the hope of our homes. Men, we can get robbed by getting simply a pink slip. Now we feel we have no worth to the family. 
because we're not bringing the income in. That's a robber. We can have a loved one that can be incarcerated. That's a love, uh, robber. We can have family members that are stuck on liquor, stuck on drugs, stuck on pornography. That can be a robber. Takes us away from our appointed business. Takes us away from our focus on God. It becomes our God. This man was robbed. He was stripped of his clothing. He was stripped of his possessions, his raiment, his covering. His covering. When a child loses a father, it's in the home. That's his covering, his earthly covering. When a person walks away from their relationship with God, that's their heavenly covering. That's their raiment. That's your covering. You've walked away from that. You've allowed the world pull you away from your relationship with God. That's a robber. He was leveled. His clothing, his personality, his position, his provisions. He was now broke. He was now in poverty. He was wounded and discouraged. You know, that's, that's, that's a painful thing when a man is stuck up. And he's forced to take off his clothes. He's forced to give up his money. He's forced to give up his possessions. That's, that's, that's an embarrassment. That's an embarrassment. He, and to women who are heads of homes, to lose jobs lose positions. Then he was left. They left him. They had no more use of him. They took his clothes. They took his possessions. Used up. How many times we've seen people, not here, how many times we've seen people in our communities that have just been left because they've been used up. They have no more use. Seniors sometimes feel that way. They feel that I, because I have a little snow on the roof or my sunroof is peeled all the way back to the back of my neck that they have no more use. What I have to say is it has no more relevance. Left. It's left. Life was sucked out of him. Left for half dead. No longer a benefit to them. Nor a vantage to be around. You ever seen a person? Professional sports. I can relate to this, Coach. You know a little bit about this. Professional athletes. When you're on, you have a whole entourage of people. You have friends. You have acquaintances. You have leeches. <laughs> but when that fanfare is over, when you can't strap the helmet on no more, you can't put the lacrosse stick in your hand no more, or hold that football, they leave. Because they have no more use for you. There's no benefit to be around you. No material benefit. So we see people all the time that have been left. We see professional athletes. Two years after their careers are over, they're in poverty. They're in depression because they've been left. And they've been leveled. Then looked over. Here comes a religious leader. Can I get really relaxed here? Here comes a religious leader, the caller. He walks by and then goes to the other side. The religious leader. The person who's supposed to be all about helping the hurts. He walks to the other side. And then comes the, the, the man from the by the up and coming, the staunch, they all ba 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 ba. He comes. He just, he doesn't even come over. He just goes to the other side of the road. He sees it from a distance and says, "I don't want to get in the mix of that. So let me get onto the other side of the road right now." But then here comes the man from Samaria, who 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 comes to the need of this individual. You know, AAA has it. They have these little vehicles that can run up and down 71 and I-90 and 480, looking for people that are level, looking for people that are left, looking for people that are looked over. And they pull up and they come out with their little bright vests on and flashlight if it's nighttime, and happy smile, maybe have some coffee in the car or the truck, and they are called what? The Good Samaritan. Seeing how we can get you back on the road, get you back on your way. AAA has it down pretty good. Go out and look for those that are on the side of the road. Good Samaritan. Well, the Good Samaritan in this story, the first thing is that he saw the man. Now remember, he was on his way somewhere. But he saw the man. He took the time to look. He didn't pretend like, I don't see this going on. I don't see this man that got robbed and leveled and left naked and hurt and wounded. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm going to pretend like I didn't see that. He saw it. And then he had compassion. 
His heart was pulled. Something has to be done. This man has just been leveled. And then he addressed the man's needs. He stopped where he was going. He stopped his agenda to help this man. Now, oil and wine was very important back then. Wine wasn't just for communion. It wasn't just for to keep my thirst. Wine had multiple purposes. It was an astringent, an astringent. I know I'm not pronouncing this right. Help me. But poured on the wounds to clean the wounds. And the oil, a soothing balm. We have that. We have the gospel. We have our witness that can be a soothing bomb to someone that's hurt and injured. So he shared his goods. And then he took cloth. I don't think it was corduroys. I don't think it was jeans. I think it was fine woven cloth. And he bandaged his wounds. That would be like uh, me taking a $50 tie and wrapping somebody up that has a gash and is just oozing blood and everything else. You're going to put a $50 tie on that man's wound? He uses cloth. How many times have we seen individuals that don't look too good, don't smell too good, and put them in our car? Now, remember, he put this man on his beast. Back then, that was their car. That was his transportation. And I don't think, I'm going to take my sanctified imagination, I don't think they both rode on that donkey together. I think he put the, he put the man on the donkey, and he walked beside him. That would be like us putting an individual that we found on the side of the road, in our cars and taking them to a safe haven. I had time, I would tell this joke, this true story about my wife. I am going to tell it. I got, a, I got a few minutes. I got a few moments. My wife saw a person she thought she knew. We were going down 71 North to downtown. I can't remember where we were going. And she said, stop. I know him. I pull over, and I'm like, okay. He starts running to the car, and as he puts the hand, his, hand, his hand on the handle, she screams out, I don't know him, I don't know him, pull off, pull off. I'm like, <laughs> we can't pull off now, because now we're the good Samaritan. He seeks relief. So I said, well, you get in the back seat. Why are you in the back seat? Get in the back seat, because now you don't know him. I surely don't know him. So you get behind him. Well, why? I told her later. I said, because if things go wrong, I'm hopefully you won't worry about your nails, and if you need to clunk, 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 clunk him in the back of the head to save us, then you can but she dared to care. And I, and I couldn't just pull off. But believe me, I was praying hard, hard and strong. Please let him not be a robber. And he wasn't. And we took him down to his next stop and let him go. His way. He put the man on his beast. He took him to an end. Now remember, he was going somewhere else, probably to the inn where people stay. So he's had business there too. Gave money to the innkeeper and said, take care of this man. How many times have we done that? We probably have. But there's somebody next door to you across the street that doesn't know anything about this good Samaritan way. And we need to share that with them. And if they're a believer and maybe just in a black, backslidden condition, we have to let them know that, you know, we have an obligation. We have a charge to keep and a God to glorify. We have a responsibility to go, not just to go and mm, I'm saved in Jesus Christ, I'm wrapped up in him and I'm clothed in him, blah, blah, blah. We are to go out and share that good news in word and in deed. We have that challenge. So he tells the innkeeper, do whatever you need to do, and when I come back, whatever else I owe you, I will pay you. So also that man had a relationship. His word was bond. They tended to him. So the Good Samaritan had EMS care. He came on the scene and addressed the situation. He had protective care where he took the man to an inn. And then he had aftercare. How many times we've worked with somebody that's been low as low, lost as lost, and leftover as leftover meat? And we get them started on a healing process, but we don't follow back up with them. That's just as bad as leaving them on the side of the road. So he had aftercare. He said, when I return, so he was telling him, I'm coming back. And whatever else you spend over and above what I've given you, I will make good. I'm almost done. When we look at the Good Samaritan and take inventory of our life, doesn't Christ and what he did for you come to mind? What Christ did for you. Were we not leveled? Because of sin, we were leveled. We lost our connection with the Lord. That's leveled. We, never, we didn't have our heavenly covering. 
We didn't have our heavenly connection. We were leveled, lost, looked over. Just as the Samaritan had compassion for the fallen man, Jesus had compassion for a fallen mankind, which included you and me. Now, I was in college, so I didn't think at first I didn't have any problems. I had it all going on. I'm an athlete, star athlete in my own mind, getting a higher education, looked pretty good, built real nice, all that good stuff. Thought I had it going on. My father said one day, he said, boy, you about to bust soul, he called it soul, soul wide open. Meaning I was about to bust hell wide open because I did not know Christ. I don't care how good you look. I don't care how, good, how big you built. You don't have a relationship, you're about to knock the bottom out of it. Because that's where you're headed. Because it is appointed once to die, then the judgment. So I was level. I was, I was lost. And many of us were. So the Good Samaritan was that love connection, that love interest that we chose, that we had enough sense at one point in time in our life to make Jesus our choice. So we were leveled. And we have to understand that, that Christ was our good Samaritan. Don't you remember that Jesus had compassion for a fallen mankind? He also had compassion for the sorrowful. You'll find that in Luke with the widow's son. He had passion for the weary. He said to the weary, come to me, all ye are weary. He had compassion for the helpless. Remember the boy with the unclean spirit in Mark 9 and 20 and 22? He also even is an account in Hebrews about compassion for the ignorant. That Paul speaks of Hebrews 5 and 2. I don't know about you, but I also was in that number. I can, I can assume at one time you were. You were lost and level. I know I was. But the thing to sum all this up uh, is one word. O-V-E. It was love. Love made that man see that situation. Love made that man stop from going on his way. Love made that man come out and give his best for that man's worst situation. Oh, y'all should get with me. For his worst situation. The man was level. He, was, he wasn't clean. He was dirty. I mean, if you're getting robbed, you tussling, hopefully. You're a man. You're going to be fighting. So he's dirty, stinky, cut up, bleeding. His worst. And here comes the good Samaritan giving his best. Doesn't that sound like God? Giving his best for our worst? Oh, y'all should get with me. Giving his best for our worst. This Samaritan gave his best. Gave his money. Kicked out his dead presidents, as the young people would say. Now here's my money. Take care of this man. And what I owe y'all return, when I return, I'm going to pay you. It was love that lifted him on that beast and, and brought him to that safe haven. It was love that lifted us. It was love that Jesus allowed himself to go from judgment hall to judgment hall. It was love that allowed Jesus to decide that I'm going to walk on that De La Rosa road and go up to the skull of Golgotha. It was love that Jesus allowed himself to be nailed on the cross and lifted up for our falling down. And then uh, uh, there was love that allowed him to stay up there and then be put into a borrowed man's tomb. It was love that rolled away that stone. It was love. Love that lifted the man that was on the roadside. Love that lifted us, love that lifted me, when nothing, nothing, nothing else would do. But the love that lifted me. Love lifted me and love lifted you. Love lifted me. Grace and peace be unto you.